Professor Salm, and this is part two of the Unit 2 screencast for uh, bacterial pathogens of the human body. So we left off at the Streptococcus genre, and um, we talked a little bit about, just to recap, the um, Group A strep, uh, strep pyogenes, uh, and now Group B strep I touched on a little bit. Um, it's mainly um, known to be... Uh, pathogen really almost anywhere in the body, and particularly the fact that it crosses the placenta and infects newborns uh, is significant. So we see all ages, um, whether they're immunocompromised or not, anyone can succumb to a group B strep infection. Um, and uh, it can cross the blood-brain barrier, cause meningitis. It can cross the placenta and cause neonatal sepsis or bacteremia, uh, neonatal pneumonia. Often uh, it is implicated in preterm labor. And women can carry group B strep by asymptomatically. Uh, men can as well. So it's one of those funky organisms that, you know, it can be nor uh, normal flora in lots of different areas on the body, including the skin, uh, gut, and in the respiratory tract. But um, when our um, microbial antagonism, our normal flora, is out of a balance, the group B strep can become an opportunistic infection. Uh, penicillin usually uh, covers it, but uh, in the event that someone is penallergic, you can uh, treat with clindo or urethro. Um, let's see, the viridin strep group is uh, considered an alpha hemolytic strep. Uh, if you remember, hemolysis is in regards to how it grows on a blood agar plate. So the alpha hemolytic would be partially hemolytic, meaning there's like a gray or green sort of uh, zone surrounding the colonies. Uh, the Virden strep group is normal flora in the gut and, and in the respiratory tract as well. Um, it can cause dental caries or cavities um, and also be implicated in meningitis or bacterial endocarditis as well. Let me get it in full screen mode. Uh, your strep pneumoniae, oh, hold on just a second. The strep pneumoniae group uh, is typically considered to have like a capsule around it and uh, a, a gram morphology is described for this um, organism as being like lancet shaped diplococci. So uh, somewhat elongated, uh, lancet shaped meaning slightly elongated cocci with um, uh, sort of pairing end to end. Uh, they will form alpha hemolytic colonies on the agar and will oftentimes have this sort of mucousy appearance to them. This causes pneumococcal pneumonia, sinusitis, uh, and otitis media, ear infections. It can be a bloodstream path blood, um, pathogen, bacteremia, and endocarditis, so again, um, the lining in the heart, and pneumococcal meningitis. We can gram stain, uh, we can diagnose strep pneumonia even from a gram stain if the, uh, if the gram stain is done properly and the specimen is fresh. Uh, there's also something called a quelling reaction, which you won't need to know about. But I think I have on your dichotomous key the optogen sensitivity for strep pneumoniae. No other alpha strep are sensitive to optogen. Uh, so we will see a zone of inhibition around an optogen disc. Um, optogen is a kind of antibiotic. Uh, treatments, penicillin typically, urethroenclindo can also work. Um, and then uh, vancomycin. Uh, can also be treated uh, for any gram-positive infections. Prevention, there's a vaccine, I believe it's called Prevnar, uh, that is given to pre premature babies um, and also to elderly. Enterococci fecalis, uh, this is another strep gram-positive cocci. This is uh, found in, this is actually a gram stain of enterococci fecalis in lung tissue. Typically, enterococci fecalis wouldn't be something that would get that low in the respiratory tract except if it's causing an infection. So you can also see these round, um, these look like almost blood cells possibly um, that we're seeing here. I, or they could be some type of a white cell. They seem kind of big for a, um, they seem kind of large for a red cell. So I think we're seeing white cells here. Typically white cells on a gram stain will indicate um, that there's an, um, an active infection going on that the body is prompting an immune response to. Um, you may also remember in your gram stain lab that there were epithelial cells that were sort of sigmoid in shape or squamous, um, squamoid in shape. And so uh, white cells can be differentiated from skin cells in that way. Uh, white cells tend to be quite um, circular or round. Uh, so that covers pretty much the um, 
gram positive cocci that you'll need to know for this unit. Um, I think I've also listed micrococcus, which isn't really considered a pathogen uh, for humans uh, unless something kind of weird is going on. Um, there can be an opportunistic pathogen, but we use micrococcus in lab, so I think it's worth you being aware of. But these are the main pathogens um, in the gram positive cocci gram morphology. So the gram positive bacilli. Uh, morphs. We've got a nice scanning electron micrograph of Bacillus anthracis here. The only um, Bacillus as a genre, the only species within the Bacillus genre that we care about is Bacillus anthracis. Um, Bacillus anthracis can infect your GI tract, your skin, or be inhaled. Uh, very high mortality rate for the inhaled anthrax. I'll show you a picture of the cutaneous anthrax. And then GI um, anthrax is usually through, you know, consuming food that has large enough cell counts of bacillus anthracis to make one sick. Um, but that's not as common. The eschar, which is a black wound, um, the black eschars are characteristic of cutaneous anthrax. Now you may look at this and say, well, how does that differ from gangrene? Um, it is difficult, I think, to differentiate the two. Uh, usually, doctors will collect exudate and gram stain, and that's how they would know. Um, also, uh, Bacillus anthracis has a unique, you know, um, doctors will usually ask for information about the patient in terms of what their line of work is, perhaps. Um, people who work in the environment, you know, maybe are um, wardens or work uh, in the outdoors a lot, could. Uh, succumb to a bacillus anthracis uh, infection, but particularly people who work as vets with animals or work with pelts or furs will be uh, more uh, likely to catch anthrax, cutaneous anthrax. Uh, bacillus uh, as a genre, these are considered large non-modal GPB. Um, we would uh, I think this slide is supposed to be for Bacillus anthracis. We would actually take lung or skin samples and gram stain it. Uh, Cipro and a lot of other antimicrobials will actually treat anthrax. It's very treatable if you catch it in time. That's the main thing. So we have vaccines for, um, for military people. Uh, you'll need multiple doses and boosters. And then also if you're working with animals as a taxidermist or as a zoologist or whatever, um, are more likely to catch it. So you want to be very good at hygiene if you're working in those areas. The, another uh, GPB that you want to know about is Clostridium perfringens. Clostridium perfringens causes gas gangrene. Um, you can also get food poisoning from it. Here's a picture of the um, gas gangrene. So we have on the distal ends of the toes, distal meaning um, away from the uh, origin of the, of the limb. So we have on the distal ends of the toes this um, black necrotic tissue. Uh, also noteworthy for Clostridium perfringens, it's a strict anaerobe, so it cannot grow in the presence of air. It tends to be deep tissue pathogens, so although we're seeing the outside of the skin dead, we um, can assume that Clostridium perfringens is growing happily deep in the tissues. Um, you would do plate culture, you can do gram stains for this. The, again, the incubating has to be completely free of oxygen. Um, if someone has food poisoning, they can self-limit. Uh, it's difficult to prevent because this um, clostridium forms spores that are hardy enough to exist in an environment under very dry conditions or um, a very hot or cold conditions. So it's very difficult to, um, to control the contracting of it. But um, if, you, if you have gas gangrene, they will um, take out whatever dead tissue exists and um, clean it up and put someone on antimicrobials. So, uh, Clostridium difficile we hear a lot about in healthcare. This will be an opportunistic pathogen. We all have C. diff in our gut, um, but when someone has been on antibiotics, they tend to get an upset in the balance of the normal flora in the gut, and a um, C. diff can, infection can result. Also, a pseudomonas colitis. Um, oh, wait, serious cases can cause... This is actually not spelled right. This is pseudomembranous colitis. So pseudomembranous colitis, I apologize for that, uh, is, isn't that funny? This was actually from the book, pseudomembranous 
colitis uh, means to have this false membrane or this film kind of coating the, um, the intestines. And uh, C. diff can be life-threatening if people don't get over it on their own. Um, so if you have it for weeks or months um, after a long run of antibiotics, you want to see the doctor for that. Um, we would normally do, uh, you can isolate the organism in feces, but it'll be through an immunoassay. We're going to look for C. difficile toxin or antibodies to C. diff. Uh, we don't typically plate culture this. It's not a very reliable method. Um, treatment, they'll either take you off the antimicrobials uh, that you were on prior to the infection, or um, you can sometimes go on, um, uh, like, a, would they put you on Vanco or Metronidazole? Um, there are a couple of antibiotics that they can switch you to. So they'll either take you off antibiotics or switch them. Um, proper hygiene is imperative in the healthcare setting to keep from passing this on. Clostridium botulinum we don't see very much of um, in developed countries, but it causes foodborne um, uh, foodborne infections. Also, infants can get botulism from uh, raw honey. And then also wounds um, if you have like a rusty nail or um, a wound where the endospores will get into, you can get a cutaneous botulism. Diagnose it, uh, you would, this is again, a, this genre as a whole is a strict anaerobe, so you um, would typically, doctors will treat based on symptoms. Um, you could culture for it as well, but um, sometimes doctors will just treat empirically if they know that the circumstances are right um, to cause botulism. Uh, treatment, they've got antimicrobials and botulinum antitoxin, and also making sure that you don't eat food that is contaminated. Um, cans will start to expand because of the gases formed from the botulism, botulinum um, organism growing inside the cans. Uh, again, infants shouldn't consume raw honey, honey either. Uh, Clostridium botulinum, Clostridium tetani, the cousin to botulinum. Um, this would be an example of what tetani looks like. Pretty interesting. We don't see a lot of tetanus around, but it has a unique characteristic, the way it gram stains. Um, so you've got like this lollipop sort of appearance, and this is like an endospore, a spore forming on the end of the rod. And here's a picture of, some, of a child with tetanus. Now, although we don't have troubles in the developed areas of the world, this is still um, a, a pathogen that they see much more often in developing countries in the world. Soil and dust is where you can catch it. Um, we've got a vaccine in the United States for it, um, but we could do a uh, diagnosis just through the muscular contractions that occur because of it. Um, there's immunoglobulins, antimicrobials, and immunizations for this. Uh, listeria is another gram-positive or gram positive bacilli. Listeria is something that we look at. Um, I think the group that presented this did a really great job. Um, it is a pathogen that can exist in cold temperatures as well as room, um, room temp or body temp. Um, it can cross the placenta and cause illness in uh, infants. Uh, it can cause preterm labor. It causes meningitis. It can cause foodborne illnesses. Uh, we would diagnose it. grows very nicely on plates. Um, we can also see it on a gram stain. Uh, most drugs will treat listeria if you can catch it. That's the important thing. Um, and it's kind of all around uh, in low quantities, so it's um, difficult to prevent. So that covers gram positives, and for gram negative, I am going to have to take uh, um, to stop here and actually start a part three. Um, so uh, peace out and stay tuned for part three. Thanks.